Hello everyone and welcome to Calvary. Whether you're new and just curious about faith or you've been here for years or anywhere in between, we are honored and grateful that you've chosen to be at Calvary today. And if you live near a Calvary campus, we wanna invite you to come on location and check out a live service. Each location has an amazing community of people who would give you a warm welcome. And while you're there, be sure to stop by the Welcome Center after the service. They have something special for you. And if you're new here at Calvary Online, we invite you to visit calvary.ch slash guest. Connect with us and let us know how we can best serve you. Well, some of you may not already know that we have an incredible mobile app to help you connect to all that Calvary has to offer. The Calvary app has all kinds of resources, on-demand messages, a daily Bible reading plan, and your very own dashboard that helps you discover your next step in following Jesus. The app is a great way to take Calvary with you wherever you go. Go to calvary.ch slash app to get a link to your app store and download it today. Well, we gather weekly to align our hearts with God and our lives to his mission. And so today, as we gather, we will sing some songs of worship, celebrate a time of communion as we remember Jesus and the sacrifice that he made for us, and we'll hear a message from the Bible that is relevant to our lives today. So let's dive in. Calvary starts right now. God in our lives to his mission. Let's stand and let's worship together. Joy awaits my prayer. 
Thank you so much for worshiping with us. Go ahead and have a seat. Good morning. Hey, my name is Brandon. I'm the next gen pastor here. I get to oversee our kids and student ministries, and I, I just love I love what I get to do. It's it's amazing, um, man. It's it's my favorite. So um, I just want to tell you guys, we got a big week coming up in, in student ministry. We've got Winter Escape this weekend for our middle and high school students, and we're stoked about it. I'm going to talk about a little bit about that more uh, later in the service. But but why I tell you that right now is because uh, as we approach Winter Escape. Uh, the team's been just kind of praying through and pouring over this passage that we're going to focus on uh, for the weekend. And so I wanted to share that with you guys today because um, it's just, man, it's why we're here. It's what it's all about. It's why we come to a place like this uh, regularly. It's why we gather together so that we can align our hearts to God and our lives to his mission. And this passage just says that so well. It's from Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. And it says, the son, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God the firstborn over all creation. For in him, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authority, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him, all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. And man, that, that passage so clearly says that, that Jesus is above all. He's above all creation. He's above culture. He's above whatever we could bring to the table. He's above it all. He reigns over it all. He rules over it all. And yet he loves us so deeply and so personally that he was willing to step down out of heaven and give his life as a ransom for our sin, for our mistakes, for our failures. And man, that's why we're gathered in this moment so that we can remember that. So each, each week we come to this time of communion where we celebrate who Jesus is and what he did for us and, and the fact that we don't have to walk in death anymore. We get to walk in new life because of him. And so here in a moment, I'm gonna pray and give you an opportunity to take communion. If you got it, great. If not, you can grab it. Uh, there's still some in the back. We'd love for you to participate with us in this. But man, it's just such a great opportunity for us to sit together and celebrate who he is and what he did and the fact that we can have life because he gave his on our behalf. God, we love you. and We thank you for the fact that you sent your son to this earth, that, that all your fullness dwelled in him, God, that he was the perfect image of who you are. And God, we thank you that he gave his life on our behalf so that we could find life in him. And God, as we come to this moment of communion, as we, as we sit and as we uh, contemplate who you are and what you did, God, I pray that the gratitude would be on our hearts and on our minds and that we would remember that sacrifice and that we would give thanks for it. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Our mission is to live and love like Jesus. One way we do this is by giving one extra dollar to help those in our community know and feel the love of Christ. We call this One for One. Last week, our offering went to a single mom whose car was recently stolen. After being found by the police and returned to her, her car was stolen a second time, but was wrecked. As a result, she lost her job because of having no transportation to work. A family member loaned her a car to use, but now that one is out of commission as well. Our dollars will go to help her purchase reliable transportation so she can get back to work and to show her there is a God who cares for her. Because of your generosity, here's what we're able to bless her with.
This week's One for One was nominated through Calvary Shadow Lake for a mom who is going through a messy divorce. She has spent the past seven months traveling between Nebraska and Alabama to regain custody of her three young children who were taken there without her permission. In that time, she lost her job, has gotten behind on her rent, utilities, and car payment, and is paying large amounts in attorney and legal fees. The children are now back home with her. She has access to childcare, and she is looking for a full-time job. Our dollars will go to help her get back on her feet and to show her that God loves and cares for her and her kids. Thank you for giving to the One for One. When we give, we are impacting the lives of others, one life at a time. Hey Calvary, as we continue to learn more about the devastation in Turkey from last week's earthquakes, one of our global partners reached out asking if we might be able to help. These partners have connections with teams already on the ground and have turned their efforts to crisis response, providing relief and aid to those affected. Through your intentional generosity, we have set aside money for when disasters such as this arise. And this week, we were able to give a gift of $3,000 to aid in their relief efforts. Thank you for joining us as we strive to impact the lives of others. And please join us in praying for our partners as they continue to provide care and compassion today and in the weeks ahead. Good morning, Calvary. How are we doing today? Are we good? Yeah, hey, I'm so excited to be with you. That, uh, I love the fact that uh, we are a generous church. Uh, we believe it's upon us to show God's love in all its various ways, and one of those ways is through just sacrificial and ongoing generosity. And a uh, matter of fact, the gift that James just talked about, uh, we last year, over the years, we've kind of had this, uh, what's called the Disaster Relief Fund. So there are times where uh, just horrible, tragic things happen, and we have some funding set aside for that, and there's times where we ask the church to help replenish uh, or feed into that, and we're able to help like last year with uh, some uh, a church in Ukraine uh, that was going through the early phases of what was happening there, and uh, through the excess of what was given last year, there was $3,000, and someone gave a matching gift, so what James just referred to, we just gave $6,000 towards that effort, and I think that's pretty amazing, so yeah, thank you for being a part of that, and uh, you know, I, I often, uh, when I come into a church setting, you know, most people look at me like, well, you're the preacher, you're a pastor, and, and there's certain things that you just think. And I, uh, you know, there are things I think about church and believe about church. Uh, one of those things is this, is that I am always mindful that any given Sunday, there are different expectations people have for what's about to happen or what's about to be said or where you're at in life. And what I mean by that is there are some people who come to church and they're at a place where they're looking for hope. Uh, they're at the end of the rope. They don't know what to do next. They don't know where to go. Uh, every day is just a, a challenge to get through. And they're thinking, I, maybe I'll try a church. And so some of you are here today thinking, man, I, I'm looking for some hope. Give me some hope. Some people are coming to church and they're looking for healing. Uh, they've been going through a challenge and heartache and loss and pain or suffering. And, and people are saying, I, I want to get better. I want to get well. And I need God's help to make that happen. And, and then there are people who come to church and, and they're looking for a place of refuge. You're, you're looking at the world uh, or maybe your own world is in turmoil. And this is a place where you can get away and relax and rest and just not be bombarded. You know, you look at the world around you, um, and my wife came across a video this last week. She shared it with me about how just somebody presenting their opinion that we are not made to handle all of the world's trauma all the time. We live in a world where the you know, every day, every moment, if you want to look at your news feeds, you will look and see that there's heartache and pain and tragedy everywhere, and, and, and it's just overwhelming. So your view of life is just, it's just an awful world. It's a terrible world, and and, and, and some, you come here for a place of refuge uh, or you look to Jesus as to be your refuge and that's awesome. And, and so some of you come with this expectation also of, of, you know, you're looking for purpose. You're looking for direction. You're looking for significance in your life and, and, and that's why you're here. So I don't know why you're here. Maybe it's a mix of all those things. But my point of all saying that is, is we try to be mindful of all uh, uh, and all are welcome here to come and lean in towards Jesus with us. We ourselves are working through all of that stuff too, just so you know. Every leader you see on a stage or every pastor or whoever, like we're all working through those things as well and we're all 
looking to Jesus. So wherever you're joining, whatever location you're at, Shadow Lake, North, online, wherever you are, South, uh, and I'm, I'm just wanna say I'm truly glad you're here. We've been in a series this year since January 1st called 52. We're spending 52 weeks with Jesus. And we're getting to know him better, and specifically, we're looking at the person of Jesus. We're using a study book uh, by Mark Moore called just Quest 52, if you want to get it on Amazon. Great way to follow along. I know, like, I don't know, a thousand or so people have bought books, and that uh, we're leaning in and just saying, Jesus, who are you? Who are you, and what kind of a difference can that make in my life? And last week, we looked at uh, step part one of two part series of mini series within this is, what was Jesus's life purpose? Did Jesus have a purpose? And last week, we looked at this story out of Luke chapter 15 and then 19 about how Jesus was a friend of, anybody remember? Sinners. Sinners. Jesus was a friend of? Sinners. Turn to somebody and say, if you're a sinner, Jesus is your friend. (laughs) If you're a sinner, Jesus is your friend. All right? So some of us have this opinion again, like, hey, I know I'm a sinner and, and I'm not worthy of any sense of God's love, but that's exactly why Jesus came. We looked at the story of Zacchaeus and uh, Jesus told Zacchaeus, hey, come out of that tree. I want to spend time with you today. And it says, uh, it, it says this in Luke 19, 7, all the people saw this, began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. In other words, people thought, you know, there were some religious people there who thought only they deserve God's love. But Jesus was a friend of sinners, friend of people who were disobedient towards God, who weren't even mindful of God. Jesus wanted to be their friend. He wanted to spend time with them. And he changed that key as his life. And then he offers this, his purpose statement that we looked at last week was directly out of Luke 19, 10, where Jesus says, for the son of man came to what? Seek and save the lost. So if you're lost in this life, lost in guilt, lost in shame, lost in frustration, lost in isolation or loneliness, Jesus came to seek you out and to rescue you. And so today we look into part two of his mission, of his purpose for being. And so if you have your Bibles or Bible apps, please open them up to Mark chapter 10. Mark is one of the gospels of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the gospel of Mark records for us a phenomenal passage. Um, I love to take a little bit of time each week. So when we jump into a passage, uh, we'll look at it. And, and, and the context is important. Uh, what, what's happening right before this? What's going to happen after this? And so, so I want you to understand, Jesus has been doing life and doing ministry with a small group of disciples, but there are big crowds following Jesus. And through everything Jesus did, he set his face resolutely. He had a mission, he had a purpose, he had direction in his life. And so what he did, he did with intentionality. And so the story we're going to look at today, a little bit of a setting. If you're a maps person and you love geography, I love doing this stuff. I nerd out. I realize most people don't enjoy that stuff, so I try not to go over the top on it. But if you look at a map today, you can just look up where the Sea of Galilee is. And on the south, uh, north side of Sea of Galilee, to the south side around there, um, around that whole region was Jesus's home base, okay? Uh, it, it's where he kind of centered his ministry out of. If you grew up Jewish, as Jesus did, Jewish customs were that you would go down to Jerusalem, kind of essentially the capital city of Israel. You would go down for the celebrations, the feast. And Jesus was going to head down to Jerusalem. Scripture says he headed up to because it's up in elevation. But Jesus traveled from the north to the south to Jerusalem. And, and uh, he went there to celebrate Passover. Passover is this annual feast to remember how God had helped the uh, Israelites escape the Egyptians and, and because of the, the lamb, uh, of the, the blood of the lamb was put on the doorposts and the angel passed over those homes that led to their rescue, to their salvation. So it was a huge celebration. Now you need to understand, Jesus made this trip roughly 80 to 90 miles, about three times a year. He would go to Jerusalem for these huge feasts, huge celebrations, and so he's traveling with his disciples. Now, here's what Jesus knows. So get this in your mind as we look at this passage. It it will be within days of this that Jesus is going to be going to the cross, and Jesus knows that. Jesus knows he is walking towards his death. I can't comprehend that. I don't know if you can. 
But let's try to wrap our mind around, Jesus knew where he was going, his disciples were with him, he's been trying to tell them what's about to come, what's about to happen, and this is where we pick up the story in Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 32. It says, they were on their way up to Jerusalem again, up in elevation, uh, as they travel from the north uh, to the south towards Jerusalem, and it says, with Jesus leading the way, and the disciples were what? Astonished. While those who followed were what? Afraid. I had to stop and look at this. Uh, I, what I'm doing here today is just so you know, if some people ask like, why do you teach like this? This is called expository teaching or preaching where you're exposing the text. You're walking through it little bit by little bit. And, and so, so I love to you look into these components and understand some things. Why were the disciples astonished? Why were those traveling with afraid? Well, one, I, you, you, we can make a really strong case that they were astonished that Jesus led with such conviction. Leaders go first. Leaders lead the way. They lead the charge. They're ready to go. Right? They, 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 they are, their face is set towards the goal. So Jesus is headed towards Jerusalem. They were astonished. In, they already knew this. In Jerusalem, Jesus was hated by all the top leaders. The Jewish leaders uh, had, a, had the market share on how religion was to operate. It was based on the Old Testament, parts of the Old Testament. The Old Testament, what we refer to as Old Testament, was pointing to a Messiah, was pointing to the fact that a Savior would come to rescue them from their sin and shame. But the religious leaders of the day, as a nation state, uh, they, were pre they were preserving the, the national, the political, and the spiritual stage as they knew it. And so Jesus was a disruption to that, and, and they had already threatened to kill him. It was also under the reign of the Roman Empire, the whole thing. And you do not disrupt the peace that the Roman Empire wants upon a land. Jesus was a disruption to the peace because of the religious leaders. And here Jesus is marching towards Jerusalem. They were astonished. And those who, who weren't quite sure, but they were following Jesus, they were afraid they were more than likely afraid for their lives, afraid of what was about to happen to them, uh, afraid of how the Jewish leaders respond, how the Roman Empire and, and its guards and its legion were gonna respond. And here is Jesus just leading the way. Some of you have been uh, maybe at a place in time where you've been around somebody whose face is set upon something so resolutely. You know, you know what I mean? Like, uh, you know, I remember being a young man going into some big games. Those, that was my first taste of, of, of of, of, if you will, a, a mini type of fight or a battle, right? Where you are, you are going, hey, we got a big game and you're ready for that game. And you got the couple jokers going, man, these guys are gonna cream us. They're gonna kill us. They're gonna, and shut up, let's go, right? That was me, just so you know. Apologize if the word shut up offends you. Sometimes people need to hear that. So, so I'm like, no, let's go. What are we doing? We don't need to be afraid. Let's go. Maybe you've had a big project or a big assignment or a group project. Many of you are in the military and you understand that when it's time to go, you want strong leadership. You want confidence in leadership. Let's go. And that's where Jesus was. He resolutely was set out. While most were paralyzed with fear and, and not sure like what's going on, Jesus was resolute. And it says this as we continue in verse 32. He's, Jesus, I'm sure, is picking up on, on what's going on. And it says, again, he took the 12 aside. So the crowds are following, but he took his inner circle of 12 disciples with him. And he told them what was going to happen to them. Now listen to this. Jesus says it very clearly. We are going up to Jerusalem and the son of man will be delivered. He's referring to himself. The term son of man is a reference to himself. The son of man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death. And will hand him over to the Gentiles. Gentiles simply meant non-Jewish people. Here he's referring to the Romans, Pontius Pilate, all them that we read about soon hereafter. He says, and they will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Now, I don't know about you, but Jesus uh, could not have painted a more clear picture of what's about to happen to him. I'm gonna go, the religious leaders are gonna turn me over and I am going to be brutally beaten and I'm gonna be killed. But three days later, I'm gonna rise. Have you ever been in a time and place where you uh, heard something? Let's say you 
get in an environment where you're gonna listen to a guy talk for 30 minutes, but you only remember like two sentences of it later? <laughs> Can anybody relate? Uh, I'm trying to think of like what settings that could be in. Uh, but uh, hey, me too, me too, all right? I, I understand, uh, I totally understand. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not shaming anybody for that. But, but have you ever been in a setting where, you know, maybe you're listening to something for this amount of time and you walk away with, this is what I heard, and it's not always in context? It's not always the thing that was meant to be heard or the greater picture of what was heard or, you know, you, you, just, you, you just tuned out, you checked out. I don't know how many times I've had people quote me or say, hey, well, one time you said this. I'm like, what, when, uh, what was, when did I say that? Or, you know, and, and you have to break it down. Or have you ever tried to talk to a, a spouse or your kids or your parents or whatever? And all you hear is, but you said, You're like, yeah, but that was not in context of what I said of the whole, I was explaining this, or I was using the spiritual gift of sarcasm that I have. And, and then that's not always well understood. Are you with me? Sometimes you can hear a lot, but you, you, you pick out of it what you wanted to hear. And that's exactly what the disciples do. The disciples just heard Jesus say, I'm going to go, I'm going to die. And, and, and the disciples are stuck in this place where you need to understand the nation of Israel uh, throughout history had already been oppressed many times. Uh, they had been scattered. They had been brought back together. Now the Roman Empire is coming. This has happened numerous times. Then the Roman Empire comes in. And if you grew up Jewish, you were tired of the oppression and you wanted it to end. And, and you've heard talk about a Messiah, a Savior who's going to come. And, and religious leaders of the day, 2,000 years ago, and this is actually very, it's true today as well, all the way through today, staunch Jewish believers who have never accepted Jesus believe that the Messiah is going to be an earthly king who will restore all the boundaries and borders of the original nation of Israel as according to way back when. And so if you've not received Jesus or understand that the Savior is actually someone coming to rescue anybody, anywhere, anytime in the spiritual realm for the purpose of being restored to God, then, then you've missed out. And so these, these followers of Jesus, they're in with Jesus, but they're also going, hey, we're gonna go to Jerusalem and restore our kingdom of Israel, Right? And Jesus, we've seen you do miracles. We've seen you heal people. We've seen you provide miracles of food for 5,000 people with a snap of your fingers. You just, Jesus, you can do anything you wanna do. And so some of the disciples are like, oh, we know what's about to come. They're about to get it in Jerusalem and we're gonna be on the throne. We're gonna be ruling. So even though Jesus is like, hey, I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna die, they're like, yeah, right. But three days later, you're gonna rise. So then you'll be king. And so listen to how James and John respond. Two of the disciples it says this, that they responded to Jesus' news about this. They responded, James and John, sons of Zebedee, came to him and said, teacher, uh, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. That's a loaded question. We want you to do whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, Jesus asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. In your glory is a phrase like when you, Jesus, when you're on the throne of Israel, when you become king, may we be at your right and left. These are the two highest positions of power. To be at the right and left of the king is the highest positions of power. They wanted to be on top. They wanted to be ruling in the kingdom. And, and instead of listening to what Jesus just said about he's going to die, they are saying, how can we position ourselves best to get everything we want out of this life? How can we leverage Jesus and his authority to get what we want out of life? So Jesus says this. His response is, you don't know what you're asking. Jesus said, can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? It's not, that's some language that we don't use in our culture. Can you drink the cup? It means the experience I'm about to go through. The cup represented an experience, a journey one was to go on. Can you drink of the same cup? Can you go through the same things? Have you been baptized in the same way? There's a uniqueness to what Jesus was baptized for to fulfill God's purpose and plan. And there's only one who had the purpose and plan of Jesus. And, and he's like, can you do that? And typical men, sorry guys, we do this, right? We can Sure, Jesus, we got it. Whatever you need. These are the guys who are ready to roll, all right? The sons of thunder, um, they're ready to roll. And Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right and left is not for me to grant. Those places belong to those 
for whom they have been prepared. What is Jesus talking about? Like Jesus says, you're right, you, you will drink of the cup, this experience. And what is he referring to? James, this is James and John. You can look up church history on this and read about it. James would become the first martyr. Soon after this, he would be killed for his faith and belief in Jesus. John would be brutally tortured and sent to ex die in exile on, a, on an island. Like die all alone. So Jesus is like, oh yeah, it's coming guys, just so you know. You wanna follow me, it's gonna cost you. If you, if, you wanna, if you wanna chase after me, that's what it's gonna be like. And then look what it says in verse 41. When the 10, these are the 10 other, there were 12 original disciples, right? These are two talking. When the other 10 heard this, they became indignant with James and John. Uh, indignant, mad, upset. Right? What, was it because we don't know why exactly? What, were they indignant that James and John were asking for the positions at the right and left? Were they indignant that they didn't pick up on the fact that Jesus just said he's gonna die? We, we don't fully know, but it says they became indignant and Jesus just called them all together. Look what it says in the next verse, verse 42. Jesus called them together and he said this. You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials excise authority over them. Uh, he's, he's saying that in unique reverence here, obviously the Roman Empire, the Gentiles again are non-Jewish people, uh, but he's just, I think this is a great leadership principle in general. He's looking out and he's saying, take a look at people who are in positions of authority and power. And what they do is they leverage their positions of authority and power for their own personal gain. How can I make life easier for me? How can I get more? How can I have more? How can I have more people serve me and meet my needs? How can I extract more, get more, 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 more? Are you with me? Uh, we've all seen that in our life. You can turn on the news and you see it affects all the time. The, the, the people in positions of authority most often will leverage it for their own personal good. And Jesus says, that's the way the world works. And they're all probably nodding in agreement. And then Jesus says this to them in the very next verse, not so with you. Nudge somebody and say, not so with you. Not so with you. Not so with you. Jesus is saying, you gotta live different. If you're gonna follow me, we live different. We look different, we talk different, we say different things. Why? Because Jesus will now define it. He says, instead, whoever wants to become great among you must become your, what? Servant. And whoever wants to be first must be, what? Slave of all. Whoa. This goes against everything you've been taught in school and in the culture that you and I have grown up in. It goes against it. it goes against the grain. Does it not? Like we, we are taught, if you want to be great, it's all about you. It's all about getting people to serve you and your needs. It's all about you being on top of the dog pile. It's all about you being great. And Jesus is like, mm -mm. He says, not so with you. If you want to become great, you must be servant. A servant, by definition, is simply one who meets the needs of someone else. To meet the needs of someone else. Whoever wants to be great must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. The image of slavery, it existed in Israel at the time, throughout that whole region. Uh, many of them, uh, the nation of uh, Israel, had been enslaved for 400 years in Egypt. Uh, uh, empires continually were taking people and enslaving them for purposes. Uh, to, to, why? To serve their own interest and their own greater need. We would all say slavery is awful and it's evil and it is. And here Jesus says, there's an attitude of the heart. Man, I, I will serve you. You have a need, I, I would... I will meet your need. What is it you need? And then Jesus offers his mission statement, if you will, the purpose of his life, his reason for being in the very next verse, verse 45, for he said, even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Would you read that verse out loud with me? For even the son of man did not come to be served, 
but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. If anyone could have demanded that everybody around serve him, it could have been Jesus. All-knowing, all-powerful son of God, co-creator of the universe, now coming to live in the flesh, God in the flesh with us. He could have came and said, hey, you all are gonna bow down and meet my needs, my demands. You are going to serve me. But Jesus says, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. And how did he do that? The very next line is how he did that. What did he do? He gave his life as a ransom for many. A ransom payment has a really simple image to it. If in time, those who were enslaved, who who had no rights, no privileges, they were just enslaved and, and forced labor, A ransom is somebody going, that's wrong, and I am going to pay the price to free you up. Pay the price to whoever's done wrong. What do you want and need? Because they are worth it. A a, a ransom is is when soldiers are taken captive behind enemy lines. They are held captive, and and they cannot be let go. their, Their life is literally in danger. And someone looks and says, you are worth it no matter what. What's the ransom? I will pay the ransom. Jesus paid the ransom for our captivity to what? Our sin. And it's the resulting guilt and shame and and, and the sense of worthlessness and and the addictions and all the things that come along with when we choose to say, God, I don't want to live with you as my number one priority. You know, I'll I'll pop in from time to time. I'll check in when I need you. But I'm going to live my own way, and, and, and that's to live in disobedience to God. And so when we live in disobedience to God, we then become captives. We are held captive by our sin, and, and the payment for that sin, ultimately, if you are in captivity, is death, which the Bible describes as separation from God forever. So Jesus comes into the world. God says, hey, it's not okay. I want to pay the price for that. I will send my one and only son into the world because they are worth it. And the scripture says that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life with God. Whoo! So Jesus said, I will pay the ransom for your sin. And the scripture says that Jesus alone can pay the ransom for our sin because he was sinless. He is the only person to ever live who has been without sin. And so Jesus says, I will die for you. I will serve your greatest need. You may think your greatest need is more cash, more influence, more more peace around you. No, your greatest need and my greatest need is to have the penalty for my sin forgiven. That is our greatest need. And Jesus says, I will pay the ransom. I will pay the price so that you can have the forgiveness of sin. I will pay the price for you to walk freely with God from here on out. That is who Jesus is. That is his purpose. And what Jesus did is he continued to show that. He followed through on that. As you turn the pages of the gospels, you see that Jesus indeed was betrayed, beaten, crucified. He was put on the cross. And indeed, as he said, three days later, he was raised to newness of life. And he walked again and he led his disciples again. He said, now, disciples, here's what I want you to do. Jesus lived his life in a way where it was about putting the needs of others in front of him, so much so that imagine, guys, your, your best buddies come in. You've been walking in the dirt. Right? You, you, you've been walking uh, with your sandals on, and there was this tradition that when you entered a home, uh, often the servant of the house, the lowest of the household, or the, purpose, uh, the person serving the needs of the household would come in, and they would wash the feet of the guests. Jesus was the premier guest at the dinner with his disciples. And what did he do in John 13? He came in, he got down on his knee, took the basin of water, took the towel, and he washed each of their feet. And then Jesus said these words. So if you want to follow Jesus, if we want to follow Jesus together, this is what it looks like. Jesus says, I have set an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Jesus is the master, and he's asking us to be the servant. In other words, we are not above washing feet. We are not above serving anybody who's in need. We don't get to go about life with our own message 
of who we think Jesus is, we go with the message of, I didn't come to be served, but to serve, I will live my life accordingly. Author Mark Moore says, the cross of Jesus is not merely what he did for us. It is the model of the life he demands from us. The model of sacrificial, unconditional love. So where do we begin? I, I wrote down this week, I said, let me just do a personal inventory. And, and so if you can imagine, you can do this later too. I, I just wrote personal inventory on a scratch piece of paper. And, and, and I just asked the question of myself, to be served or to serve? And I, I wrote my wife's name. What would Mike Lean say about me? Do I live my life? Do I? That's a vulnerable position. I didn't ask her this question. She'll hear about it today. But I just wrote down, like, would my wife look at me and say, Scott exists to be served or to serve? In my relationship with him, does he live as though he's serving needing to be served or he's wanting to serve? Would each of my kids say that, that I live my life to be served or to serve? Would my coworkers, would my friends, what, you know, I just started listing, like writing down all the people and like looking at this personal inventory of what would that actually look like? What does it look like students when you go to school? What do your friends and teachers say about you? Do you exist to be served or to serve? When you go to work, do you exist to be served or to serve? You know, the attitude of a servant is, is having the love of God in mind to say, you know, Jesus alone can save. His love alone can save. But, but as Jesus says, like, I want you to go and do likewise. I want you to serve. The attitude of a servant is simply asking this question of over and over again, how can I help you today? How can I serve you today? What can I do for you today? Could you imagine the transformation that would happen? We, we talk about living our life in rhythm with Jesus around here. And, and one of the rhythms that we talk about and champion often is, is the rhythm of service. And we say it this way, we serve our home, our church, our community. Why? To make God's love known. We serve to make God's love. Jesus served in order to make God's love known and he gave us the same mission. So our, do I have the attitude of a servant in my home? I mean, men, can you imagine what might happen in your home if your attitude towards your wife, now wives, don't nudge your husbands right now. Don't even look at them, all right? Because I'm coming to you next. <laughs> but could you imagine if you woke up every day and what our life would look like if we demonstrated an unconditional love of what can I do to help you today? And we back it up with love, not complaints. Time, effort, and energy is there. Wives, what would it look like for you if you asked this of your husband? It says, I, I recognize the burdens you're carrying and, the, uh, and, and I, I want to show you love and respect the way that you receive that. How can I help you today? Could you imagine the transformation that would happen if parents, if you looked at your kids and not to be the ruler or a master over them, but to say, how can I help you today? Now, you still get guidelines and boundaries and all that. You get it set. But how can I help you today? What do you need help with? Kids, could you imagine if you go to your parents and, uh, and say, how can I help you today? You're, no, I want to warn you, your parents' first reaction is going to be the words, what do you want? <laughs> and we all laugh as adults because we've all been there. Right? And, and not even work within the other relationships uh, of our lives all the way around. But when we start living our life with the way, like, what can I do to help you? I love being a part of a church that's built on that foundation. Uh, we have an elder team, and, and you know, our elder team is constantly asking me as the lead pastor, like, hey, what, how can we help you? And I'm asking them as I report to them, how can I help you? And, and, and then on our staff team, they're asking me, hey, how can we help you? And I ask them, how can I help you? And, and we live this life of like, how can we serve one another and demonstrate God's love so that it just continues to pour out like a cascading effect of, into our community? What would it look like in our community when our people just undeniably, like we love Jesus so much and we're just genuine. It's like, what can I do to serve you? How can I help you? Employees, could you imagine? I'm not, maybe you're already there. But can you imagine genuinely look at the person you report to on your org chart? And if they thought of you and go, man, this person's here to serve. They're here to help, not just get a paycheck. Because you're saying, what can I do to help you? 
How can I serve you? Employers, could you imagine if instead of demanding work and, and results, if you, you said, hey, here's where we're going, here's what I wanna accomplish, and here's where we, where we need to be, how can I help you, and how can we work together to get this done? When we have the attitude of a servant, it just begins to change and transform things around us, and it begins to introduce and remind one another of God's love. When my family does something for me, Man, shame on me if I have the attitude of that's right, I'm the man of the house. Everything in me wants to, in my flesh, that's right. But in the spirit, in the spirit of Jesus, like, thank you, that helps me. Like, I, 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 and when I'm saying that, I'm saying I see and feel a reflection of God's love through the way that you serve me or help me with this need. And I hope and pray that converse, that is true. Like when people, when I have encounters with anybody in my home, church, or community, that, that in some way, shape, or form, not because of me, but because of his mercy, like I hope you see and experience and feel God's love. And our church family, we're just all over the place. This is what we're striving to do, whether it's a parking lot or cups of coffee or kids ministry or what's happening online or wherever it's at. Like why are we doing that? It's to make God's love known. Why is that so important? Well, if you know God's love, you know why. If you've never experienced God's love, I want you to continue to lean in. I've really been just amazed what God's been doing over the last few weeks. So many people have been making decisions to follow Jesus for the first time, or they've been maybe stalled out with Jesus in a way for a while, and now they're leaning into Jesus's words and saying, I'm ready for my next step. What do I need to do next? How can I move forward? Because Jesus came not to be served, and, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. So if that's you, if you feel as though you've been held captive by either by yourself or by the lies of this world and you're ready to break free and lean into Jesus, now's the time. Say yes to him. Put your faith and trust in him. Repent of your sins. Confess that you want him to be Lord of your life. Bury your life in the waters of baptism and be raised to the newness of life. As Romans 6 says, we're buried with Christ and raised to a new life with him. Why do we do that? To embrace his love. All of these things we do to see and to embrace his love. And so if you're not sure where to start, I just wanna remind you, we're here all week long. After service, come talk to us. Come and just say, I'm ready to take my next step. I wanna lean into God's love. Maybe you talk to your small group leader. Maybe you talk to the serve team leader that you're a part of here at Calvary. Maybe it's one of us pastors, whoever. Just seek it out. And let's continue to lean into Jesus. This week, can I challenge you to simply put at the forefront of your heart and mind the attitude of, how can I help you? How can I serve you? And just see what Jesus might do through you in the lives of those around you when you begin to live and love like Jesus. Father God, thank you for today. God, I needed this challenge from your word as much as anybody. God, it's so easy. God, I'm just confession of my heart. It is so easy to just wanna live for myself and order my world and, and my comfort according to my needs. God, but when I consider how you've made me and wired me and how you, uh, God, desire for me to live differently, as Jesus says, not so with you. God, that hit me personally this week. God, that that's not how our follower of Jesus lives because that's not how Jesus lived. God, may we have the attitude of Jesus. God, not to be served, but to serve. We thank you that Jesus came for us. He died for us. And he was raised for us with the promise of new life so that we too may understand we may have new life. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.
so much for worshiping with us. Go ahead and have a seat. Um, we're going to direct our attention toward the baptistry. So we got more baptisms. Yeah. <laughs> Light, action. <laughs> well, I am more than excited to be here with Jerry Burris, his wife Sarah, friends with them today. Jerry gave me a call the other day and and I was in a meeting. I said, is it an emergency? I can call you back. He said, no emergency. Uh, but I called back about a half hour later and, and uh, I said, Jerry, what's going on? 
and he explained to me that you know, he's been walking with Jesus throughout his life, uh, but recently here through the, the 52 study that we've been doing midweek in small groups, he and his men's, the men's small group he's a part of were studying, and he just said that he's been studying baptism on his own now, just reading the Bible, and he says, I've been reading my Bible, and I need to do this step. And so he's been a part of a church family just about a year longer than I have. We were just talking, uh, uh, came in 98, 99, and, and uh, just seeing this man walk with Jesus in so many ways and just to take this next step with him, Jerry, is so powerful. So Jerry, let me just ask you to repeat after me the words that I know are true in your heart. I believe. I believe Jesus is that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and I have received him as my Lord and Savior. Jerry, I know you have. I know you love Jesus and he loves you so much. And because of that, I will now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Awesome. Hey, let's give it up one more time. It's so awesome to see, uh, man, just, it's been so cool to see uh, so many people just taking that next step of baptism over the last few weeks. Um, and if that's the next step that you're ready to take, we would love to have that conversation with you. Uh, we keep the water warm, you know? Um, so anytime you want to get baptized, we're always ready. Uh, we're always ready to help you take that next step. Hey, if it's your first time with us, we want to say thank you so much for choosing to spend part of your weekend here. It means a lot to us that, that you would uh, just come and connect with us. So we want an opportunity to get connected to you uh, and just give you some information about what we've got going on here in the life of the church. Uh, right outside these doors, if you kind of do a U-turn, there's a welcome center right there uh, where we just want to have someone that can say, hey, thanks for being here. And uh, we got a free t-shirt for you. So um, that's always fun. It's always good. Everyone likes a t-shirt, right? So, uh, yeah, thanks for that. For, thanks for being here. Uh, around here a lot, we talk about generosity because God's been so generous with us, and we believe that it's our uh, appropriate response to be generous back with him. We believe that we give so that we can deepen our trust in God and impact the lives of others. So if you come to prepare to do that today, there's three ways that you can do that. One's in the boxes in the back. Uh, you can give through the mail, and you can give online at calvary.ch slash give. Finally, as I mentioned earlier, we've got Winter Escape coming up this weekend. Who's going to be there? All right. All right. Everyone else is, all the middle schoolers are across the street. So you, they yelled too, and you probably heard them because that's how middle schoolers roll. But uh, man, it's going to be awesome. It's for middle and high school. So anyone 6th through 12th grade, we've still got some spots available. So if you are a 6th through 12th grader, uh, you should be there. It's going to be awesome. We've got Cedric Hardiman coming in to, to preach. It's, he's incredible. So don't miss it. Um, it's going to be awesome. So be there. But uh, what I wanted to do today is just take a second to pray. It's this weekend, this Friday and Saturday. Uh, so we're just going to pray for a second that God would draw students in, that they will be able to take their next steps with him. We're going to pray for our leaders for energy, for wisdom, and for energy. All right? All right, let's pray. God, thank you so much for who you are. God, just thank you that we uh, are in a season where we get to celebrate baptisms and people taking next steps. And uh, I just pray that that pattern can